If you were ever to consider the most interesting state in the US, it's unlikely you'd find yourself thinking of South Dakota. Instead, your mind would likely go to the skyscrapers of New York City or the Hollywood Hills of California. While understandably overlooked, South Dakota offers something that's always been interesting, if not controversial, Mount Rushmore. In the Black Hills of southwestern South Dakota lies a colossal sculpture carved into the side of a mountain that is a monument to former U.S. presidents who profoundly impacted the country's history. The four presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, remain immortalized in granite on the southeast side of Mount Rushmore as 60-foot-tall statue heads. Since its opening in 1941, Mount Rushmore has attracted millions of tourists who come and admire this historic landmark. Since 1959, over a million visitors have come to Mount Rushmore every year, with recent decades producing over two million visitors annually. While Mount Rushmore has often been credited as an incredible triumph of American history and ingenuity, it's not without its flaws. As unbelievable as the monument is, it's shrouded in controversy and has been the cause of pain for South Dakota natives for over a century. To some, it's a shrine to democracy. However, to others, it represents America's dark history of broken treaties and stolen land. The idea for the monument to democracy in the form of U.S. presidents first came about in 1923. The mastermind behind this unusual concept for a monument was South Dakota state historian Jonah Leroy Duane Robinson. He's known as the father of Mount Rushmore, even if his name does sometimes get sidelined by more well-known figures credited with the monument's existence. When he was removed from the project in 1929, he stated, South Dakota has already forgotten that I ever had anything to do with the matter. At its conception, this unnamed project wasn't necessarily about preserving history or paying homage to some great former presidents, there was an ulterior motive. Robinson hoped that by creating such an unbelievable monument, tourists would come from all over the country just to see it for themselves. Considering South Dakota didn't have much to offer tourists, Robinson believed that this could change that and give the state something unique. With a vision in mind, he needed someone to make it a reality. To enact his vision, Robinson persuaded famed sculptor Gutson Borglum to join him. Borglum was already well known for his various sculptures and monuments that he'd been involved with throughout his career. Some of his earliest works were busts of American leaders. It was only later in Borglum's career that he started carving gargantuan statues into natural rock formations around the country. His most famous examples include an Abraham Lincoln statue. The bust was a colossal head placed in the rotunda of the Washington, D.C. Capitol. It now lies in the crypt below the rotunda. At the time, it inspired Southern women to commission him for his first foray into mountainside carving. As a result, he went to Decatur, Georgia to sculpt Robert E. Lee and other Confederate soldiers marching across the face of a mountain, though he'd never finished the project personally due to leaving over funding disputes. Regardless, it was enough to get him involved in Rushmore. Robinson sent Borglum to the Black Hills region to determine if the carving was in fact possible. The original site intended to be the home of the presidential monument was a series of granite pillars known as the Needles. However, when Borglum went to the Black Hills, he determined that the Needles had already eroded and were too thin. On his second visit to the Black Hills, Borglum found a new potential site for the Monument. The mountain was known by the Lakota Sioux tribe as the Six Grandfathers, a modest mountain with an elevation of 5,725 feet. However, local settlers knew it primarily as Cougar Mountain or Rushmore after the New York City attorney Charles E. Rushmore. The Rushmore name was so commonly used that it stuck, cementing Charles E. Rushmore in history when all he did was check legal titles on local properties in 1884. Regardless of the name of the mountain's origins, in Borglum's eyes, it was far grander than the initially proposed location. Moreover, he wanted the mountain's southeast side to be the monument's home due to its maximum exposure to the sun. Upon seeing six grandfathers, Borglum said, America will march along that skyline. Once Borglum set his sights on six grandfathers, he realized that Robinson's original vision might not have had enough reach. The original idea was to center the monument around heroes of the American West, so instead of presidents, it would be figures like Buffalo Bill Cody, Red Cloud, Lewis and Clark, and various others. Borglum, however, wanted this monument to have more national reach and significance. So, with Robinson's support, Borglum began conceptualizing a new vision. This vision uh, would be most of what we see today, but concessions were made along the way. It might seem like on its face, these four former presidents were chosen because uh, they're some of the most well-known presidents in American history. However, it's far more nuanced than that. Borglum wanted to represent a 150-year progression of America by including who he deemed to be the most pivotal presidents in the country's history. Ultimately, he decided on four presidents who fit the bill. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. 
George Washington was the first president of the United States. He led colonists into the American Revolution and won independence from the British. Washington isn't just one of the most prominent presidents in US history, but also the most prominent figure carved into Mount Rushmore itself. He represents the birth of the United States. Thomas Jefferson was the third president, and more importantly, one of the primary authors of the Declaration of Independence. Other major achievements include the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the US back in 1803. As a result, he represents the growth of America. Theodore Roosevelt might seem like an odd choice to the unknowing tourist, but it makes perfect sense. At the time Roosevelt was president, the country was rapidly changing. It was a period of significant economic growth as the world entered the 20th century. As the 26th president, he oversaw this rapidly changing time by expanding trade capabilities in the country with the Panama Canal and cracking down on corporate monopolies. Our Roosevelt's inclusion on Mount Rushmore represents the United States' development. Finally, Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president. Like Washington, the inclusion of this president was only natural. Lincoln's enduring legacy is ending slavery, the Civil War, and keeping the Union together when it was tearing at the seams. His inclusion represents the preservation of the United States. With the monument mapped out and relatively designed, it was time to bring this idea to the most important people, the ones with the money to make it happen. Not everyone was on board with the South Dakotan Monument to Democracy. Initially, Robinson took charge of getting the funding needed to get the project up and running. He was aided by Rapid City's mayor, John Bolands, and one of South Dakota's senators and former governor, Pete Norbeck. They had enough money to start the project, but knew that they never completed any time soon at the rate that they were raising money. Luckily for them, in 1927, months before construction was set to begin, President Calvin Coolidge came to Black Hills on vacation. He was convinced to visit the Black Hills by Congressman William Williamson, a fierce advocate for the monument. Borglum convinced Coolidge to deliver a speech at the site of the future monument, which started a dialogue between South Dakota and Washington, D.C. about it. Borglum seized the opportunity to head to Washington, D.C. to discuss the monument with the then Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon. Ultimately, these talks resulted in Calvin Coolidge signing legislation in 1929, which appropriated the project $250,000 for the Rushmore Monument construction. Today, $250,000 equates to over $4 million. This legislation also created the Mount Rushmore National Memorial Commission, which oversaw the project but infamously neglected to include Robinson. The reasoning behind Robinson's exclusion, despite the monument being his brainchild, was due to his lack of wealth and large-scale managerial experience. This would see Robinson cut almost entirely out of the Rushmore project, making Borglum the only true voice of Mount Rushmore's construction. Even before Congress and Coolidge bestowed federal funds to Mount Rushmore, things had already started. Construction had begun in October, a few months after Coolidge vacationed in the Black Hills. Funded by individuals and local community organizations, they managed to get started on the ambitious project. Borglum adopted various methods to carve the four presidential faces into Mount Rushmore. At the time, tools like chisels and drills were considered the traditional tools for sculpting. However, sculpting was only one aspect of the project. They needed to mold the rock that would allow for sculpting to even take place. So, to clear some layers off the mountain, jackhammers and dynamite were used for the trickier aspects of the construction. Using this combination of tools, they could get through larger amounts of mountain rock much faster than traditional methods. In total, some 400 workers removed roughly 450,000 tons of rock from the mountain, which still resides at the base today. Most impressive about Mount Rushmore's construction was that while it was a dangerous job, no lives were lost. Over the course of two years and a few months, they managed to complete the head of George Washington. Almost immediately, they then started on Jefferson's head to the right of Washington. It was around this time that the workers noticed that the site where Jefferson's head was being carved was too weak to handle the construction necessary, so they blasted off what had already been done and moved Jefferson's head to the opposite side of Washington, completing it in August 1936. By September 1937, Lincoln's head had been completed, and a little under two years later, in July of 1939, Roosevelt was completed as well. While final details and all the skulls and the overall site needed to take place, they'd managed to achieve the bulk of the work. Borglum was incapable of thinking small. Everything he did, he wanted to be grandiose. One of the first things to be abandoned from the original plan was an 80 by 120 foot inscription next to Washington's head, known as the Entablature. This inscription would detail the nine most significant events in the United States history from 1776 to 1906. It would be done in the shape of the Louisiana Purchase. Originally, then US President Calvin Coolidge was to write the text that would be inscribed on the side of the mountain. However, Borglum and Coolidge thoroughly disagreed on the language of the text, so when Coolidge died, Borglum sought the help of the people. He created an essay writing contest that produced the text they'd use written by a Nebraska native, William Andrew Burkitt. Borglum wasn't really a fan of the winning entry either, though. 
though. Construction on the inscription began in 1930. They managed to get a fair amount done before things started going wrong in other aspects of the monument. In 1934, when they relocated Jefferson said, it became clear they needed the site for the inscription to be used for Lincoln instead. Borglum conceded that the text was never going to be able to be read by visitors to the monument, and as a result of this and the lack of space, they just scrapped the idea altogether. Undeterred, Borglum concocted a new idea that was even more incredible than the last. It was also doomed to fail, but it remains one of the most exciting aspects of Mount Rushmore, the Hall of Records. With the inscription officially dead, Borglum moved on to bigger and greater ideas. He truly did think bigger and envisioned a hall of records that would be carved into the mountain. The idea of the hall of records was for it to become home to some of America's greatest treasures, artifacts, and documents, including the Declaration of Independence. Work began in July 1938, and it started with a 70-foot tunnel being blasted into the mountain. Behind the brow of Abraham Lincoln lies an 18-foot doorway that is out of sight to the average visitor looking up at the mountain. Accessing the hall of records requires a journey up the mountain, thanks to a set of stairs that lead behind the presidential lineup. Of course, this is a journey nobody is allowed to enjoy as it's been banned to the public. Even high-ranking officials have been banned from reaching the Hall of Records. The reason is primarily for safety concerns associated with reaching the room. The ban was made stricter in 2009 when a group of Greenpeace activists managed to get to the top and hang a banger that read Stop Global Warming. If someone were to cross the threshold, they'd find themselves in an empty room that is 75 feet in length, 14 feet wide, and 35 feet tall. You can still see the efforts made by those constructing the monument to make this room a reality. The jackhammer holes for the dynamite and the red numbers dictated what needed to go where. As we know, this wasn't how it ended for the Hall of Records. The original idea is far from what we have today. Borglum's vision for the Hall of Records was just as grand as carving the faces of four presidents into a mountain. The plan was to have an 800-foot-long staircase ascending the mountain leading to the Hall of records. At the top of this trek would be glass doors with a bronze eagle overhead with a wingspan of 38 feet. This room would have walls covered with the records of America's conception, creation, westward movement, expansion, the president's information on the monument, and the reason it was built in the first place. Beyond the walls would be busts of famous Americans, important documents, and artifacts. Borglum was planning for the future. Not future generations, but future civilizations, or maybe even aliens. He wanted the purpose of his monument to live on long after his death. Unfortunately, if aliens do decide to make South Dakota the first stop on their earthly journey, they'll be disappointed to find a largely incomplete and nowhere near as impressive Hall of Records. In 1939, Congress halted the construction of the Hall of Records. Instead, they wanted construction to focus entirely on the project's original scope, which was the President's faces. With this, Borglum's grandest idea for Mount Rushmore was abandoned. With all the cancelled additions to Mount Rushmore and the further tightening of funding for the project, Borglum focused his efforts on completing the main concept for the monument. Unfortunately, on March 6, 1941, Borglum passed away at the age of 73. This felt like Mount Rushmore's crescendo, considering its main architect's death and the impending involvement of America in the war efforts. World War II forced the country to redirect a lot of money to various sectors to ensure it was ready to fight and survive the war efforts on both a military and an economic front. This all meant that Rushmore needed to be finished, and it needed to be finished soon. In October of 1941, Mount Rushmore had finally been completed at the helm of Borglum's son Lincoln. Having been involved in the monument since before it truly existed, and being the superintendent of all work and Goodson's right-hand man, it seemed natural for him to take the reins. In the end, the sculpture covers 1,278.45 acres, with each sculpture being 60 feet tall. While Borglum's initial dream of an imposing monument honoring democracy was complete, many of his biggest plans are now buried alongside the architect himself. It would take more than half a century for someone to pick up where he left off. In 1998, after decades of the concept of Hall of Records existing and piquing many people's interests, it was finally completed. Of course, the finished Hall of Records is far from what Borglum had envisioned, but it was still everything he wanted in theory. Added to Rushmore's Hall of Records were 16 porcelain enamel panels, which were placed inside a teakwood box, then a titanium vault, and finally a granite capstone. The panels documented the history of Mount Rushmore, its architect, the presidents that were chosen, the Declaration of Independence, and a shortened version of American history. It may not have been everything he wanted, but at least the Hall of Records was serving its intended purpose in the very place where the work began.
We've talked so much about the conception and building of Mount Rushmore and what an achievement it was considering the ambitiousness of the project. However, in all the pieces of the monument story, we've ignored what predated Borglum Robinson and all those who fought to make Mount Rushmore a reality. Centuries before the Black Hills became the site of Mount Rushmore, it was an area known only by Native Americans. Various tribes had long lived in and around the Black Hills, which the Lakota tribe called the heart of everything that is. The story gets complicated in 1868 when the Treaty of Fort Laramie was signed, which reserved the Black Hills for the Native Americans. While it doesn't sound all that complicated, the U.S. had a difficult relationship with treaties, so when gold was discovered in the region in 1874 by an expedition led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, they found themselves needing to renegotiate. So President Grant's administration attempted to buy the land from the Native Americans, who refused as it was considered sacred grounds, with the Six Grandfathers mountain range in particular used for prayer and devotion. Regardless of the failed efforts to acquire the land through legal means, miners began pouring into the Black Hills. In total, they sent nearly 800 miners by 1875. When the local tribes fought back and attacked prospectors in the Black Hills, the US government intervened, sending troops to pacify the Great Plains. But unsurprisingly, they violated the treaty entirely by redrawing the lines stated in the Fort Laramie Treaty. As a result, a battle broke out in 1876 known as the Battle of Little Bighorn. The Battle of Little Bighorn was led by Custer, but as the story goes, Custer and his 209 men wouldn't survive the day. Regardless of Custer's defeat, by 1877 the US government had officially confiscated the land. Since then, it's been in dispute for more than a century. The most prominent of the protests was in the 1970s, when a group of Native Americans ascended Rushmore and camped there in protest of the infamous Broken Treaty. This set off a string of occupations and eventually a court case that went to the Supreme Court. The case of United States and Sioux Nation of Indians was won in favor of the Native Americans. They weren't given their land back, and instead they were awarded $105 million, which equates to over a billion dollars today. Naturally, they rejected the money, instead seeking the land back in accordance with the treaty. Since then, no money has been paid out and no progress has been made in the Sioux Nation's attempts to reclaim the Black Hills. Since its inception, Mount Rushmore has been shrouded in controversy. In hindsight, we can view some of that controversy with more scrutiny. America is experiencing a reckoning right now, where monuments to former Confederates and enslavers are being torn down in an effort to live up to the ideals that nation was founded on, liberty for all. However, in this pursuit, there's been some challenges to how far they need to go. Borglum Stone Mountain is also facing challenges of its own, considering its history with the Lakota Sioux and the artist's ties to the KKK. Of course, this is a problem that comes with countless statues, memorials, murals, and more aspects of the very history of America. In a radically different world than the one in which Mount Rushmore was conceived and constructed, perceptions of Rushmore have continued to change and evolve. Many hail this monument as a symbol of American democracy and say so with pride. However, for others, Mount Rushmore is a stain on American history. To this day, people are calling for Rushmore to cease to exist entirely. But that is a highly unlikely outcome. Just like the presidents carved into Mount Rushmore, its legacy, as complex as it is, remains forever etched in granite.